He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. OK, oh, it's me. Here we go. Kia ora and welcome to Elemental from RNZ. We are on a trip around the periodic table in an alphabetical celebration of its 150th anniversary. I'm Alison Balance. And I'm Alan Blackman from the Auckland University of Technology. And in episode 87, we're up to a very familiar element, tin. It's so nice to do something I've heard of for a change. (laughs) Tin has obviously been a ubiquitous part of modern life for a very long time. And I'd have to say it turns up in some surprising places. Here's a musical example for you, Alan. That's a tin whistle, obviously. Oh, it bring, brings out the Irish in me, I guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not that there is any, actually. But uh, okay, so here's here's one for you. How about this movie clip? No heart, all hollow. <laughs> When a man's an empty cattle. That was the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> nice one. I suppose we'd better find out more about the element tin now. OK, so tin, the name tin comes from the Anglo-Saxon word, wait for it, tin. <laughs> <laughs> now the symbol, the elemental symbol SN for tin comes from the Latin stanum. So after we get that out of the way, let's start with a bombshell. Tin cans are mostly not made of tin. <gasps> Shock, horror, I revelation. Know. <laughs> <laughs> tin cans, everybody, are predominantly steel, but they have a tin coating. So the steel is used for strength and the tin is used for corrosion resistance, plus the fact that it's non toxic and it also shines nicely. So tin's been around for a while? Yep, tin the element, atomic number 50 was uh, one of those elements that was known to the ancients. And one day, way back when, when some unknown person mixed just the right amount of tin with just the right amount of copper and heated it up, they made bronze. And bronze was much harder than the individual component metals, tin and copper, and it was perfect for (laughs) making weapons, amongst other things, of course. So important was this that it actually had an age named after it. Okay, so we talk about the Bronze Age. And this dated from around about 3000 BCE for a couple of millennia or so until the inhabitants of various parts of the Earth learnt how to smelt iron. And then we entered the Iron Age. So, tin, it's a malleable and a ductile metal. And when you bend it, it emits a really interesting crackling noise called tin cry. We played that sound back in the Indium episode, as it's something that Indium does as well. Mm -hmm. So may we refer you, dear listeners, back to episode 39 on Indium, in which you'll find another reference to tin, which is its (laughs) presence in ITO or Indium tin oxide, which made our smartphones Mm swipeable. And you can tell that the Indium episode was a very memorable one for me, because I can (laughs) recall it. Okay, back to tin. Okay, so... Tin has got two main allotropes. Now, recall an allotrope is different forms of the same element in which essentially the atoms are arranged differently. So we have a thing called beta tin, which is otherwise known as white tin, and that's stable at temperatures above 13.2 degrees Celsius. And the other allotrope is called alpha tin or gray tin, and that is present below 13.2 degrees Celsius. So what happens if we start at room temperature and it gets cold, then any beta tin or the white tin that we have tends to transform spontaneously into alpha tin. Now, the problem is that these two allotropes have very, very different physical forms. So white tin is a normal, crystalline, shiny metal, while grey tin is in fact very brittle and powdery. And this observation has led to the oft-repeated myth that uh, Napoleon's army in Russia weren't helped by the fact that their tin buttons disintegrated in the cold Russian winter. It's kind of difficult to fight when you're holding up your trousers with one hand. Do you not think that's a true story? Well, there is a book on this, actually. If you want a a very, very good read, there's a book called Napoleon's Buttons by Penny Le Couture. Uh, She, in fact, is a Kiwi, 
And she talks about this particular story as well as a whole lot of other really, really interesting chemical stories. So I'd thoroughly recommend that book. But yeah, I think the general consensus is that it's a myth because apparently they didn't use tin and buttons in those days. They were apparently made of bone. Yeah. <laughs> Read the book. Anyway, it's good stuff. Nice book. Um, Wrong story. Okay. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so tin actually appears to have been involved in a famously unsuccessful polar expedition. And this was Sir John Franklin's 1845 attempt to find the Northwest Passage. And um, this seems to have failed because the newfangled tinned food, which had only been around since 1810, they relied on this tin food, but uh, it contained significant amounts of lead from the solder used to seal the cans. Me again. We talked about that <laughs> in the lead episode, episode 43, if you want to know more. Yep. And similarly, European organ pipes, of all things, are commonly made of lead alloyed with tin. And back in the day, they were sometimes affected by what was called tin pest in the winter, with grey brittle blotches forming on the pipes. That wouldn't be a good look for your organ. No, <laughs> indeed not. <laughs> right, so tin is very commonly used with lead in electrical solders. And uh, in fact, solders is one of tin's main uses. And now we're using less lead for obvious reasons. And um, so one of the results of this is that solders high in tin can be subject to another phenomenon known as tin whiskers. Oh, they sound like fun. <laughs> so these form in electrical devices when metals form rather long whisker-like projections as a result of stress. And I take it that's physical stress rather than mental stress. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, obviously you don't want this happening. You don't want these little tin whiskers because they can cause short circuits. So what else about tin? So I've already mentioned the fact that metallic tin is non-toxic. That's why we make tin cans out of it. But certain organotin compounds can be particularly nasty to humans. So organotin compounds are compounds which contain a tin atom bonded to organic molecules, in other words, molecules made predominantly of carbon. So an example of this are things called tributyl tin compounds, and these were used for many years as bottom paints on boats as anti-fouling agents. However, unfortunately, these compounds would slowly leach into the marine environment and they'd get into the food chain, and as a result, they are now banned. Good thing too. Now, <laughs> I feel like we haven't done tin chemical justice yet, so have you got any curious chemical facts about tin that, that you'd like to share? Okay. Well, tin is a world record holder in the fact that it's the element with the largest number of stable isotopes, and it's got 10 stable isotopes. And that's probably not unrelated to the fact that every tin atom contains 50, 5 zero, protons in its nucleus. Now, 50 just happens to be a thing called a magic number. Now, if you want a complete list of magic numbers, these are 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. So what does this mean? <laughs> what are these magic numbers? So any of these magic numbers of either protons or neutrons in an atomic nucleus confers significant stability on that nucleus. That's great. <laughs> I'll try and remember those numbers. What's your favourite <laughs> tin use? And so this is another thing I didn't know until I started reading up about tin, is the fact that you can actually thank tin for the fact that the windows in your house are made of even thickness glass, known as float glass. Okay. So, so how tin... is tin implicated <laughs> in the manufacture you, of glass? You may well ask. So in fact, it's not implicated, it's absolutely vital in the manufacture of glass, but not as an additive, as you might think. So panes of glass are generally made by a thing called the Pilkington method, which was developed in the 1950s, and this involves pouring molten glass onto a bed of molten tin, and then you let it cool down and solidify, and that ensures that the glass is absolutely perfectly flat and its thickness is perfectly uniform. And the reason they use tin, because tin doesn't stick to the glass. Well, well, well. I have some interesting <laughs> word facts to add in. Okay. So a stannery is a word used to describe a tin mine or a region of tin mining, somewhere like mm -hmm. Cornwall. So stannery from stannum. Yeah. yeah. And there used to be tinsmiths, so mm -hmm. as opposed to blacksmiths. Yeah. So tinsmiths fixed things made from tin. And mm -hmm. that's actually where the word tinker comes from. Ah, okay. And going back to your comment about tin cans earlier, 
Mm-hmm. Australians, of course, call their drink cans tinnies, or as mm-hmm. we would hear it, we'd, we think they say it like teenies. Indeed, yes. <laughs> and they've borrowed that term to describe small aluminium boats. I did not know that. <laughs> which brings us to the end of this episode of Elemental from RNZ, in which we have been tinkering with oh, the chemical element tin. Good. <laughs> and you can find plenty more chemical tinkering, including the other episodes we have referred to, at rnz.co.nz forward slash chemistry. RNZ Elemental is a podcast at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and plenty of other podcast places. Don't forget, if you're enjoying the series and you're able to, we'd really appreciate it if you can rate or review us. We're back next time with Titanium. But until then, I'm Alison Balance. And I'm Alan Blackman. Matewa. Thank <laughs> you.